There, the camera's going. Okay, James is happy now. All righty, uh, let me pray. Father, we just want to pause and um, thank you for your word and for the opportunity we have to come and uh, study your word tonight. Uh, Lord, I'm asking especially for, the, for myself because I'm distracted by all this new technology. Help me just to um, do a good job and not be uh, frazzled by the camera and the uh, recording and all that so that uh, your word can go forth in a, in a, in a, a competent way. So I lift, our, I lift this class up to you, I lift myself up to you, and ask you to take over and guide and direct us throughout this evening. And we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and the recorder here is underway. So we got, we got our audio and video going. Okay, session 12, lesson one, I said lesson three, page one. Is everybody there? You, you should be looking at a mini, a mini, um, yike, a mini uh, table of contents. Uh, part five, the end of John's ministry and the beginning of Christ from section 29 to section 42. See that? We'll cover all those sections in lesson three. Uh, turn the page. And uh, part six. On page 2, the ministry of Christ in Galilee from section 43 to section 51. So we'll cover all those sections in the second half of lesson 3. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, let's turn then to section uh, 29. Section 29, that's page 3 of lesson 3. And we'll pick that up in our harmony on uh, section 29 is found on page 38 of your harmony. John chapter 1 at the bottom of the page. It's a single column. Single column. Okay, John's self-identification to the priests and Levites. Verses 19 through 28. Okay, everybody there in their harmonies? All righty. Now this section covers the approval of the Messiah by his herald. And so at the top of the page, you see the heading, Report to the Sanhedrin. Now remember we talked about the two-stage obligation the Sanhedrin was under when a Messianic movement appeared in Israel. The first stage was a stage of observation. The uh, representatives from the Sanhedrin would go out to the Messianic claimant or out to the Messianic movement and they would simply observe. They would not ask any questions. They would not get involved in a debate. They would just look and see what's going on. Then they would have to come back to the Sanhedrin and report. Is this a significant messianic movement or not? And of course that has occurred and the report has come back to the Sanhedrin. Hey, this thing is a significant messianic movement. So the stage of observation is complete. So now we're entering the second stage. We're beginning the second stage of the Sanhedrin's uh, examination. So that's the Sanhedrin's response now is to begin stage number two the stage of investigation. So from this point on, we'll see the representatives of the Sanhedrin asking who, what, why, when, how, where. We're going to start grilling John the Baptist to find out more details about this Messianic movement. All righty. So as we come to John chapter 1, verse 19, as we go through the first few verses, we will see that this is an official delegation that's talking to John. And if you, uh, I'll point out to you that they have to report back their findings to those in charge. They have to uh, report back the results of their investigation. So let's start with verse 19. So John chapter 1 verse 19. And this is the witness of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from, Jer from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So that's the first question, who are you? And again, notice they are an official delegation from the priests and Levites. Uh, verse 20 brings us to the reply, the answer. And he confessed and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. Now, uh, a lot of Jewish people think that Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Christ got married and had a son, and his, his name was Jesus Christ. Well. The word Christ is not a, a last name, it is a title. Christos uh, is the Greek for Mashiach. 
or Messiah. It comes into English as Messiah or the Christ, okay? So he's the Christ, the Messiah. So he says, no, I am not the Messiah. Very clear answer. Verse 21, first part of the verse. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And the second part of the verse is the answer. Are you the forerunner of the Messiah is the question there. Because Elijah is the forerunner of the Messiah. And he said, I am not. So note that very carefully. He is not Elijah. And we'll discuss the relationship between John the Baptist and Elijah uh, later on as we gather more information about these two guys. We'll sum it all up. All right, continuing on in verse 21. They ask another question. Are you the prophet? And at the end of the verse, he answers them very clearly, no. Now, why would they ask him, are you the prophet? Well, they're asking him three things. First of all, are you the Messiah? No. Are you the forerunner of the Messiah, Elijah? No. Now, uh, the next major person that they're concerned about then is the prophet like unto Moses. So they're basically asking him, are you the prophet referred to in Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 through 18? Basically they're referring to this section of, of scripture in their, in their um, question. Are you the prophet like Moses? So let's read Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 through 18. It's up on the screen. Uh, God says to Moses, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, excuse me, Moses is speaking, and he's speaking to Israel. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, like Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So you see there's a very specific prophet with a lot of authority that's promised to Israel. So their question is, if you're not the Messiah, you're not the forerunner, are you this guy? And his answer is, no, I'm not the prophet either. Well, with that, I'd like to examine this idea of the prophet like Moses as found in a Jewish thinking. So we're in the middle of page three on lesson three, and the heading is a prophet like Moses. And there are many rabbinical connections between Moses and the Messiah. He is uh, considered basically what we would call a type of the Messiah. And there's two major connections. A. Moses is connected with the coming of the Messiah, and Moses is connected with the rulership of the Messiah in, um, in rabbinic thinking. Now, Rabbi Joseph Klausner had a very important quote that I've given to you on, the, uh, on your outline. It's also up on the screen. Rabbi Klausner makes a very clear statement. The exalted Moses of Judaism is the ultimate source of the Messiah in Judaism. So you see the rabbis see Moses as what we would call a type of the Messiah. Someone who's prefiguring someone to come. So Moses and the prophet are uh, very important in rabbinic thinking. Now point two at the bottom of the page. We come to the rabbinical comparison between Moses and the Messiah. And there are seven comparisons I'll bring out for you. And I think you'll, uh, I think you'll see Jesus in these in these comparisons. Number one, the rabbis say that the Messiah and Moses both fulfill the task of redemption. Point B, the rabbis taught that both Messiah and Moses would lead the people back to the promised land. Point C, the rabbis taught that both Moses and the Messiah wait for a long period to embark on their mission. Next page, point D. Page four. Now notice, notice point D. The rabbis teach that Moses and the Messiah will both die before the redemption is accomplished. 
you know, that is usually thrown at us as a reason to deny the Messiahship of Jesus. Well, he came, he died, he didn't redeem us, he didn't conquer Israel's enemies, you know, he didn't bring in the kingdom, he can't be the Messiah. Well, actually, that's a qualification for being the Messiah, if you look in the rabbinic writings. Now, here's a resource uh, you can pick up that will help you tremendously if you're dealing with any of these issues. The Messiah text by Raphael Patai. Now, he is a, um, or he was, I believe he's passed on now. He, is, he was an uh, Israeli scholar. He's not a believer. He's just a secular scholar. But he took all the all the uh, rabbinic material and biblical material about the Messiah and he put it in this book called the Messiah Texts. Great book. I've had it for about 30 years. And uh, but I believe this is the latest version here being put out by Wayne State University Press. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon with no problem. But if you really want to look into the Messianic prophecies and what the rabbis say about them, uh, it's a great book because, guess what? They usually affirm the uh, Christian position. Okay, get a lot of material there. All right, well, what did Raphael Patai say in the Messiah texts? On page 166 and 167, in regard to this idea that the Messiah and Moses would both die before the redemption is accomplished, but Moses died before he could lead the children of Israel into the land of promise. Remember that? He comes up to the Jordan River, he can't go any further. Consequently, for the parallel to be complete, the Messiah, too, had to die before accomplishing his great task of ultimate redemption. A suffering Messiah. A Messiah that had to die. Well, pretty neat, huh? Rabbis will say, no, 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 our Messiah doesn't die, he doesn't suffer. But uh, the bulk of rabbinic opinion doesn't agree with that. You'll get that, you'll get that smoke screen thrown at you. All right, so the Messiah will die before the redemption is ultimately accomplished. Point E, point E in your outline. Both complete the redemption after a second appearance. Again, that's thrown at us. Your Messiah, Jesus coming again. Oh, come on, there's nothing in the Bible that says the Messiah is going to come twice. Hardly, hardly. The rabbis, the... the um, the anti-missionaries depend upon the ignorance of their Jewish and Christian audience to pull this stuff off. Okay, let's take a look at what Rabbi Barakiah said. Uh, this is in uh, the Messiah text as well, page 31. Rav Barakiah. This is a quote. As the first redeemer, that is Moses, so the last redeemer, that is Messiah. Just as the first Redeemer was revealed to the children of Israel and then hidden from them, and Rabbi Barakiah thinks it will only be for three months, so the last Redeemer will be revealed and then again hidden from them. And how long will he be hidden from them? Rabbi Tanchuma, in the name of the rabbi, said 45 days. So the rabbis are, don't know how long the Messiah is going to be hidden from Israel. He's going to come, he's going to be hidden, and he's going to come again. Well, it's been over 2,000 years now that the rabbi's been hidden from Israel, and he still is hidden. But the point is, he's coming again, a second coming. And by the way, when uh, Rabbi Schneerson died in 1996, I believe it was, uh, he was the Chabad leader, guess what? They were waiting for a resurrection in 45 days. They thought he was the Messiah. It didn't happen. All right? So the Messiah will come a second time. He'll come, he'll be hidden, He'll come again and complete the redemption. Does that sound like Jesus to you? Yeah, yeah kind of kind of like it, doesn't it? Yes? How was Moses? Moses tried to start the redemption by killing the Egyptian uh, taskmaster who was, who was abusing. And then Pharaoh heard about it. Boom, he disappeared. The Midian, then he came again. And what did he do? Completed. Yeah, completed the redemption. Okay, that's the idea there. Okay. All right, also, Midrash Rabbah, Ecclesiastes 128. As the former Redeemer caused manna to descend, as it is sated, behold, I will cause to rain bread from heaven for you. When we get to a certain part of the Gospels, that'll be familiar, won't it? Okay, sound familiar? So the latter Redeemer will cause manna to descend, as it is stated, 
may he be a, a, as a rich cornfield in the land. Okay, that's their interpretation. So we have the former Redeemer, the first coming, and the latter Redeemer, the second coming, both of them providing supernatural food. Did Jesus do that? Yeah, he did, okay? All righty, and we'll, uh, this'll, you'll identify with this statement when we get further on in the Gospels. All righty, point F, point F in your outline. Both Moses and Messiah will cause manna to come from heaven. Uh, both lead his people, point G, into the desert to perform miracles. And Jesus performed miracles in the wilderness. Then we come to point three. So those are the basic seven points of comparison between the Messiah and Moses. Then we come to point three, which... Uh, is quite astounding. The rabbis teach that the prophet like Moses will be greater than Moses. This is page four at the bottom of the page there. For example, Nebuchadnezzar Shalom. The king Messiah shall be exalted above Abraham, be high above Moses. Well, Moses is the top dog in rabbinic thinking. But here we see there's, they're expecting somebody greater than Moses. Midrash Tanhuma. As it is written, Behold, my servant shall deal wisely, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And they're quoting Isaiah 52, 13. Famous Isaiah 52 chapter, 52, 53. It means, Isaiah 52, 53, it means he shall be more exalted than Abraham, of whom it was, was written, I lift up my hand. He shall be more exalted than Moses, of whom it is said, as a nursing Foster father beareth the nursing child, and he shall be very high. And they explain who this is. That is Messiah, shall be higher than the ministering angels. Now does that sound like the book of Hebrews to you? Greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than the angels. Where do you think the writer of Hebrews got all this stuff? You know? Well, I have to agree with the rabbis. I would say, yeah. Exactly. Speaks of Jesus. No, no, no. Can't be Jesus. No, never. All right. Point four. Point four. Page five. Top of the page. Question. What do the rabbis do with Melchizedek? The Greek priesthood. Do they give any credence to the Melchizedek being greater than priesthood? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They do, especially to Psalm 110. Okay. Yeah. All right. Point four. Point four. Top of the page there. The Messiah will have a greater influence than Moses. All right, what does Rabbi Ben Gershon say to that? He says, in fact, the Messiah is such a prophet, speaking to the prophet like unto Moses, as it is stated in the Midrash on the verse, behold, my servant shall prosper. Again, showing you that Isaiah 52, 53 is uh, considered by the rabbis to be messianic in nature. They deny that these days. They say it speaks of the nation Israel. But the bulk of rabbinic opinion says that it speaks of the messianic person. Moses, by the miracles which he wrought, drew a single nation to the worship of God. But the Messiah will draw all nations to the worship of God. So the rabbis understand that the mission of the Messiah was never limited to Israel. It was always worldwide in scope. And uh, does it sound like Jesus? Mm -hmm. Has he brought all nations to the worship of God? Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, the, uh, the gospel is going around the world these days. It's going around the world. Okay. All right, so now, uh, in a similar way, the New Testament contains Messiah and Moses. So let's take a look at the book of Hebrews quickly. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also in all his house. For he had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. For just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So the Messiah is greater than Moses, says the writer of Hebrews. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which are to be spoken of later. But Messiah, but Christ, was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. So the, rabbi, so the uh, writer of Hebrews 
would agree with this rabbinic position that the uh, Messiah, Jesus, is greater than Moses. Okay? Make sense? All right. Fifthly, middle of page five there. The prophet like Moses should have a major effect on the law. Point A, Moses established the Old Covenant. Messiah will establish the New Covenant. Now, the rabbis teach today that the Torah, the, the Mosaic Covenant, is eternal. It's never going to be changed. That's what, they'll, that's what they'll throw at you today. Well, is that the uh, rabbinic opinion? Well, let's take a look. Point one, a new Torah will be taught in the Messianic age. And we start with Genesis, uh, Genesis Rabbah, 98.9. Why will King Messiah come? And this is a little edited for you. He comes to gather the exiles of Israel, that is to draw all the Jewish ba people back to the land of Israel, and to what? To give them 30 new commandments. Okay, so we're adding here. Now the Mosaic law has been abrogated, okay? All right, let's see. Uh, point two, a changed, oh by the way, in your note there, see also the Messiah text, chapter 29, it should say chapter 26. Chapter 26, that's my goof. That's my goof. Yeah, and, it's, and this is only the third day of 2012, isn't it? I'm in trouble. I'm, no, this, this goof was made in 2011, so I'm okay. I'm just telling you about it. Okay. All right, number two there. A changed Torah will be found in the Messianic age. Again, the rabbis teach that the Torah is eternal and never going to change. Leviticus Rabbah 9.7. Do other rabbis agree with the modern rabbis? No, they don't. All sacrifices and prayer will be abolished in the Messianic age except for thanksgivings, or thank offerings and thanksgiving prayers. Now, if you abolish all the, um, all the sacrifices except thank offerings and thanksgiving prayers, you've just gutted the Mosaic Law, haven't you? You've just gutted it. So, uh, there will be a change Torah in the Messianic age. Also, Ecclesiastes Rabbah 11.1. Rab Hizkiah, in the name of Rabbi Simon Ber Zibdi, said, The whole Torah which you learn in this world is vanity, as against the Torah of the world to come. For in this world a man learns Torah and forgets. I identify with that, you guys. You know, this old 64-year-old hard drive. You know, I used to be able to memorize things. Can't do it anymore. For in this world a man learns Torah and forgets. But in the future to come, he will not forget, as it is written, and he quotes Jeremiah 31, 33, that the, that the new law will be what? In our hearts. I'm looking forward to that, you guys. A new hard drive. A new one. A lot quicker and an eternal hard drive. Okay? I won't forget. All right. So there will be a change Torah in the Messianic age. All right. Page, um, page 6, the top of the page. There will be a corrected Torah in the Messianic age. Uh, Yalkut on um, Isaiah 26. God will sit in paradise and interpret to the righteous a new Torah, which he will give them by the hand of who? By the hand of King Messiah. That's your new covenant, you guys. Genesis Rabbah, 98.9. And I paraphrase this because it's a long section. The Messiah will make clear the words of the Torah and give teaching. So that'll be good. You'll have a, we'll have a perfect Bible teacher then. Not somebody who says to you, well, I really don't know. You know, he will know when you, as when you ask him the question. And I got a lot of questions for him. I'm sure you, well, I know you guys do, because you throw them at me. All right? So Genesis Rabbah, and finally, the very, very influential uh, Jewish rabbi Maimonides, he was uh, about around medieval times, he says that the coming of the Messiah, hidden and deep things shall be revealed to all. So we'll get all our questions answered. We know that. The rabbis understand that as well. So uh, we agree with them that there will be a corrected Torah in the, Mose in the Messianic age. So there's a lot of connections between the prophet and Moses and, the, and Moses and the Messiah. And of course, we know that Yeshua is the one who established this new covenant that they're talking about here. The new covenant was established 2,000 years ago in Matthew 26, 28, where Yeshua said at Passover, he took the cup, 
It's the third cup of the Passover Seder. He said, for this is my blood of the covenant. He's talking about instituting the new covenant there, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So he ratified the new covenant with his own death. And then Hebrews, again, the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, he, it's Yeshua there, is the mediator of a new covenant, the new covenant of Jeremiah. So that, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, that's the Mosaic covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. All right. So there's a lot of connections between Moses and the Messiah, aren't there? A lot of stuff going on when they ask that question, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? Do you see why they ask that question now? Lots of stuff was going around in their minds. All right, let's get back to John chapter 1. And this time, verses 22 and 23. All right, everybody back there? John chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? So they're under obligation to report back with a nice 200-page report, right? What's going on here? Verse 23. He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So when he's pressed, when John the Baptist is pressed in verse 23... He quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and he says, I am simply the forerunner of King Messiah. Okay, make sense? All righty. Then at the bottom of the page there, you see the heading, Return from the Temptations. And that's a summary of verses 24 through 27. Verse 24. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, and they said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Messiah and not Elijah nor the prophet? You know, well, what are you doing? You don't have authority from, uh, because you're any one of these guys and you don't have our authority, obviously. So why do you, how come you can baptize? John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Did you see that statement, among you stands one? That indicates that Jesus is now back from the 40 days of temptation. The 40 days have elapsed. He apparently is in the crowd listening to John preaching. Question. Uh, Paul, who baptized you and why before John the Baptism, or tevila, is a very Jewish practice. It was carried out by women every month. Uh, for purification from their monthly period. It was carried out by anyone who felt they were impure. They would go through a ritual cleansing. So immersion or baptism is happened all the time in the Jewish community. Okay, you baptize yourself normally. You immersed yourself normally. Okay? But uh, a, it was a full immersion. Just you dip yourself in the mikvah and then uh, out. That's all it was. Just a symbolic full immersion. And you had to purify yourself before going into the temple. So if you, if you go to Israel, you'll see all these mikvah oats at the Southern Temple Mount Archaeological Garden where people would ritually immerse themselves before going up on the Temple Mount. So it was very, very common. And sometimes a religious leader would do that for a particular reason. That's what John is doing here. Okay? All right, did you notice in verse 27, he says that he's not worthy to undo the thong of his sandal? That's because... To take off the rabbi's sandal was the job of a slave. The, the person lowest in the social order had to do that because the sandals were the, on the most dishonorable part of the body. The sandals walked around in the, in the mud and the droppings and the garbage. You didn't want to touch the sandals, okay, the, the feet. What does John the Baptist say? I'm not worthy to even take off his sandals. I'm not worthy to be his servant. So he's lifting up the Messiah very, very high, isn't he? This Messianic person is uh, very superior to me. And finally, verse 28 there. Verse 28. Um, 
These things took place at Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now, I don't want you to be confused. Here's a map of the area, and there are two Bethanies. Uh, the first Bethany that you're familiar with is the Bethany just east of Jerusalem. That is not the Bethany we're talking about. The Bethany we're talking about is more likely in this area here, just east of the Jordan River, Bethany beyond the Jordan. Whenever you see that comment, beyond the Jordan, that means on the eastern side, the eastern bank of the Jordan River. So this is the location where John and the, all this was happening. So now, the herald has undergone the second stage of the Sanhedrin's responsibility. He's undergone the investigation stage. And remember, what happens to the herald will happen to the king. The Sanhedrin will do exactly the same thing to Yeshua as we will see as we go through the study. All right, I've used up a few minutes of your break. So go ahead and take your break and listen for the shofar and come back in about 10 minutes. And we'll continue on with section 30. So go ahead and take your break. All right. All right, let's pick it up where we left off. We're in section 30. Section 30, and uh, that is the bottom of page 6, lesson 3, page 6 at the bottom. John's identification of Jesus as the Son of God, verses 29 through 34. So we'll continue on in the John account, and that's on page 39 of your harmony, about the middle of the page there, section 30, verse 29. Everybody there in their harmony? All righty, let's take a look at that first verse. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now this is the first public identification of the Messiah by John. First public identification. And he identifies the Messiah with two concepts. First of all, he identifi identifies the Messiah with the Passover Lamb of Exodus chapter 12. Remember in the book of Exodus we have the Passover story. Uh, the 10th um, the plague has been promised. Uh, God will uh, judge Egypt by uh, the death of the firstborn son, but Israel can escape the judgment. We do so by sacrificing a year old perfect lamb and we place its blood on the doorposts and lintel of our home. Here's an illustration of that. Uh, then we go inside our homes and we spend the night in the safety of our dwellings. That night God passed through the land of Egypt. When he came to the Jewish home, the blood on the door indicated that a substitutionary sacrificial death had already occurred in that home in place of the firstborn son. Therefore, when God saw the blood, he passed over the Jewish homes and he struck the land of Egypt. And here, I like this illustration because in this illustration we have the Egyptians mocking the Jewish people. You see the Egyptians in the foreground? Look at those crazy Jews, okay? They're not ex exercising faith or obedience, are they? They could have escaped had they followed Israel's example. Here's another illustration. The parallel is this. When the blood of the Messiah marks the doorposts of our heart, God sees the blood. He sees that a substitutionary sacrificial death has already occurred for sin. So when he sees the blood of the Messiah applied to the doorposts of our heart, God's wrath against our sin passes over us. So Yeshua is the Passover lamb of Exodus chapter 12. He is also the suffering lamb of Isaiah chapter 53, the perfect lamb that b bears sin. And here's that very famous Isaiah 52, 53 passage. We'll just pick out verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that has led to a slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. So Yeshua is the suffering lamb as well. All right, let's move on to verse 30. Verse 30, this is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a rank higher than I, for he existed before me. 
Now, that seems kind of strange. This guy has uh, existed before me and he comes after me. What's going on here? Well, as to his deity, Jesus pre-existed John. He came before John. In fact, he created John. <laughs> so in, a, in, a, in, in his deity, Jesus pre-existed John. However, as to his humanity, he came after John because he was born six months after John. Okay? That makes sense? Yeah. He was before me, and yet he's after me. All right, verses 31 to 34. Excuse me, he was after me, yet he existed before me. All right, verses 31 to 34. I did not recognize him, but in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. But I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. So John's identification is very sure and very positive. And it, it's very positive because the Spirit descending as a dove was confirmation to John. Confirmation to John that this is the Messianic person. You see, John knew Yeshua as his distant relative before this time. Remember, uh, Jesus comes to him and he says, I need to be baptized of you. So he knew him as a man. He knew him as a relative. And he knew he was better, more, more uh, 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 pious than John was. You know, I need you to baptize me. But he didn't understand that he was a messianic person. And now the spirit descends as a dove and he says, oh, okay, now I know who this is. This is the messianic person. So now he knows without a shadow of a doubt that this is the Messiah of Israel. All righty, let's move on to section 31. Drop down in your harmony. And section 31, this is uh, page 7, lesson 3, page 7 at the top of the page. And section 31 deals with uh, uh, the first followers of Jesus. Jesus' first followers, uh, John 1, 35, 35 through 51. So picking up the John account still, we're in uh, chapter 1, one column there, and we'll pick it up on verse 35 and 36. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And now, the next day, John again identifies Jesus very, very clearly. And now we have a conversation with Andrew and John. In uh, verse 37. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So now two disciples leave John and want to become disciples of Jesus. Verses 38 and 39. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. And they came therefore and saw where he was saying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now isn't this a kind of a rather strange conversation? They haven't even met this rabbi, and yet they say, you know, where are you, where are you living? Instead of asking him, can we become your disciple? Well, that is what they were asking him. This statement, where are you living or where are you staying, is the means by which a disciple would submit himself to a teaching rabbi. This is an indirect question in order to avoid shame. You see, the Middle East is a shame-honor culture. You see that today with our attention on the Middle East. It's a shame, honor, culture. <coughs> now, if you made a direct question like, Rabbi, can I become your disciple? And the um, rabbi said, no, you'd be shamed, wouldn't you? You'd be shamed by the rabbi. So you ask indirectly, Rabbi, where are you staying? Where are you living? Now, if the rabbi answers, that's no concern of yours, ah, no problem. He's not gonna tell me where he lives. Your honor is maintained, right? 
Okay? But if he said that, that means he would reject you as a disciple, but your honor would still be maintained. If he said, come and see, that's the rabbi's way of accepting a disciple. So rabbi, where are you staying? Come and see. We want to be your, your disciple rabbi. He says yes. So he accepts them as disciples. He, in a Jewish context, he's accepting them to become disciples. And this is a very, very, very important moment in the life of John. He notes it in verse 39 as the tenth hour. The tenth hour. And um, this diagram, you'll see this diagram. There's an article on hour at the bottom of page 7. But if you'll turn to page 8, uh, there's the second half of that article. And you'll run across this diagram. And this diagram outlines a Middle Eastern view of time in those days. Basically, an hour was always one twelfth of a period of daylight or one twelfth of a period of night. So you see at the top of the diagram, the light area is daylight and the dark area, the shaded area, is the dark. And you see they're divided into two 12-unit segments. So if uh, the segments would vary in length depending on the time of the year. In the summer, when the days are longer, uh, each hour would be longer, one twelfth of the daylight. And in the winter, like we have now, the daylight is shorter. The, the daytime is still divided into twelve units, but each unit is going to be shorter, right? Twelve units made up the time of day and twelve units made up the time of night. So right now we're talking about the tenth hour. So you see the 10th hour is close to what we would call 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening. Day is just about done uh, when they ask Jesus so they can become his disciple. And this probably marks John's spiritual birthday right down to the hour. You know, some of us have that uh, experience. They know, some of you guys know exactly when you became a believer. I became a believer on this month, on this day, at this time, on this Sunday, or this, uh, this uh, evangelistic uh, experience. Some of you guys have that. Not all of us have that. I remember the experience, but I couldn't tell you. I could only tell you I was probably 19. Okay? <laughs> so anyway, John knew. This was so vivid to John that he knew when it happened right down to the hour. All righty, let's move on to our uh, conversation with Peter on page 9. Top of page 9 on your outline. Uh, let's read John verses uh, 40 through 42. Bottom of page 39 in your harmony is verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, <clears throat> which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. All right, so Cephas is Aramaic for Peter. Petros would be the Greek for Peter. And both of those words mean rock or stone. Now Simon was his Hebrew name. So he's got a Hebrew name, an Aramaic name, and a Greek name. And that's not unusual. I have both a Hebrew name and an English name. My Hebrew name is Eliyahu, Elijah. It's my middle name. Eliot comes into the English. My middle name is English. It's Eliyahu, Elijah. So this is very typical. Now it's the prerogative of a superior to name those under him. It's the prerogative of superior to give names to those who are subordinate to him. And Jesus exercises that prerogative immediately with Peter. I have a, P I have a feeling with Peter's personality he had to you know, lay out the issue right from the beginning. I'm in charge Peter, not you. Okay. Well, anyway, he renames him. And so this is the third disciple to come to Jesus, the, uh, the rabbi. All right, verse 43. Verse, 40, verse 43. 
The next day he purposed to go forth into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. So the following day, Philip becomes disciple number four. Now verse 44. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. So we learn of the home of Philip, Andrew, and Peter in that verse. Now on the map, you can see uh, the Sea of Galilee floating in the middle of the map there with Capernaum on the uh, western side of the lake and Bethsaida there on the eastern side of the lake. Uh, just a little inland. Uh, today, Bethsaida is inland because the uh, little inlet that leads up to Bethsaida is now silted up with 2,000 years worth of mud. So Bethsaida is inland a little bit. Now here's another map of the Sea of Galilee. This is the uh, northern end of the Sea of Galilee. Very famous Capernaum is here with its wharfs uh, extending out into the lake. But off to the east, there's Bethsaida on a little hill on the uh, northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Now if you uh, travel to Israel and you visit Bethsaida, you'll see this sign. I photographed this sign and the reason I did so is because it gives you an idea of the uh, topography in the first century. In the first century, the uh, little inlet uh, came quite far inland there and led up to the base of this little hillock. And you can see the wharf where the fishing boats would be tied up. And then off in the distance is this little hill where the city of Bethsaida sits. Now it seems quite landlocked today, but it wasn't landlocked in the first century. So here's a drawing of uh, Bethsaida in the first century. And of course Bethsaida has been excavated. These are the excavations at Bethsaida in 1997 as the archaeologists were busy there. And if you visited it today, you would see this. It's not particularly kept up. Uh, it's, uh, it's never been crowded when we've been to Bethsaida. Uh, a lot of people don't want to visit there, but I think it's very important to do so. And you can see the ruins of the houses. Here you see the basalt field stones that were stacked one upon the other to make the uh, walls of the houses. And here's another view as well. And you can see you're on the top of a little hill. You can see off in the distance here the main pathway through uh, Bethsaida. And you're, of course you can see this is the top of a hill. And you can see the many, many houses that were built uh, at that fi little fishing village. So this is the location of Andrew and Peter and uh, Philip. This is their hometown. Wow. Question. Um, yeah, Philip is number four, uh, Peter is number three, Andrew and John are one and two. Andrew and Andrew. John and Andrew, yes, are one and two, okay? John the Apostle. First, John. John and Andrew came together. 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 Remember, they were the two that left John the Baptist, okay? Thank you. All righty. All right, let's pick it up then with this uh, conversation with Nathaniel on verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now did you notice that common misconception in the last phrase there? That Jesus is the son of Joseph? Well, Matthew has told us very, very clearly that ain't the case. You know, Matthew writing to a Jewish audience says, Joseph is no way Jesus' father. Well, who is then? Well, Jesus' father is God. That's the idea. So this is a common misconception. Nathaniel is making an assumption, like many of the townspeople in Capernaum and in um, Nazareth will make. They'll make the same assumption that Jesus is the son of Joseph, and they are incorrect there. All right, Nathaniel's response in verse 46. Nathaniel said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. So Nathanael's response indicates the very low view of Nazareth that even Galileans held. You know, uh, Judeans held a low uh, view of Galileans, but Galileans even held a low view of Nazareth. It was just an extremely tiny little hamlet. You know, insignificant, absolutely insignificant. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, 
Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. And notice, he entitles Nathanael as an Israelite with no guile, no deceit, no deceit. You know, Nathaniel was just one of those guys that you would describe as what you see is what you get. He didn't hide things. And so when, he, when he's confronted with something good coming out of Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That's, his, that's what he's thinking. He's not hiding it. He's a very transparent personality. And of course there are uh, benefits, and uh, positive and negative side to that. But you know, it's a good application for us. And I think that application is brought out very clearly in Psalm 32, verse 2. So why don't you write that down? Psalm 32, verse 2. As an application for us. What does it say? How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. I wish I could say that about me. I wish I could say that about us. All of us, right? You know, if it wasn't for Yeshua, God could impute deceit and iniquity to every single one of us. But you know, as soon as we were born again and we were placed in the Messiah, in Christ, what happened? We're now viewed with His holiness. And now when He looks upon us, He sees us. He does not impute iniquity to, it, to us. He sees us as people without deceit. So that's a great blessing, isn't it? That he will overcome who we are. Okay? And that, isn't that a blessing? Sure is. Okay. John chapter 1, verses 48 through 50. 48 through 50. Let's see if we can, uh, how far will we get here today? All right. Verses 48 through 50. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now isn't that kind of a strange response? I saw you sitting under a fig tree. Ha! Ah, you're the Messiah. You know, what led to that response? What was in his background that led to that response that Jesus was the Messianic King? Well, there's a number of uh, factors that impacted Nathaniel's thinking. First of all, number one, in the middle of page six there, Nathaniel's response, number one, what caused Nathaniel to conclude that Jesus is the Messiah? Number one, the rabbis taught that the best place to meditate on scripture and receive a good meditation <coughs> is under a fig tree, for example. And the morning class wanted all this stuff, so you're gonna get it next week too, okay? What would you do without the morning class? <laughs> well, you guys asked for your share. <laughs> All right, the Babylonian Tal Talmud, Eruvim 54a and b. Rabbi Hiya ben Abba, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, expounded. With reference to the scriptural task, text, whoso, whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. Why were the words of the Torah compared to the fig tree? Here's the answer. As with the fig tree, the more one searches it, the more figs one finds in it. So it is with the words of the Torah. The more one studies, the more one studies them, the words of the Torah, the more relish he finds in them. Isn't that something, huh? You keep, st you keep going back to the fig tree, you keep finding fruit. You keep going back to the Bible, you keep finding cool stuff, right? I've been a believer since I was 19. I'm now 64. I'm still finding cool stuff. You don't outlive it. Keep going back to the Bible. You'll keep finding the figs. All righty, let's go on to Numbers Rabbah, uh, 2115. Why was the Torah likened to a fig tree? Because while the fruit of most of the other trees, the olive tree, the vine, the date tree, is gathered all at once, you know, at harvest, harvest comes, get out there, get that fruit, Get it harvested before it rots, right? One time. You only got a few days. While the fruit of most other trees is gathered all at once, that of the fig tree is gathered little by little. And it is the same with the Torah. One gathers a little learning today, 
and much tomorrow, for it cannot be learned in a year, nor in two years. You know? Nor in twenty years. Okay? I, you know, there's people out there, oh, I read the Bible. I got it down. I read through it once. Oh, please. Please. Read through it yearly, you guys. Make it your goal to read through the Bible once a year. It'll surprise you every year, right? Of course right. All right. All right, one more, I believe. Yeah, one more slide here. Genesis Rabbah 62.2. It is related that Rabbi Hia, the elder, and his disciples, others say Rabbi Hoshaya and his disciples, while others refer it to Rabbi Akiva and his disciples. So now we have three rabbis and three groups of disciples that this is related to. That these rabbis and their disciples used to sit and study where? Under a fig tree. You get a good meditation on scripture under a fig tree. So this is the first thing that's going through Nathaniel's mind. He's uh, meditating on scripture under a fig tree. Now that's one, one thing that impressed Nathaniel. But another thing that impressed Nathaniel is that Yeshua knew exactly what scripture Nathaniel was meditating on under that fig tree. And we will find out about that scripture next week. Because this is where we ran out of time in that morning class. So, and I, like I told them, you know, I, you won't come back if I don't hold a carrot out to you, right? <laughs> but we're going to leave you there under the tree, Roger. Yep. All righty. So, question. Then I have time for a question. Yes, you have time for a question. Okay. What was going on in John the Baptist's life that he would be illuminated with the understanding he had that he would that he was given the sign that the Holy Spirit would descend like a dove and when this happened, he'll know it's he was told by an audible voice. Remember, we read that in previous lessons. An audible voice told him that he would be the forerunner, that he would go on this mission, and that the one you see the Holy Spirit descending upon, he's the one. He's the one. Okay, he was told. He heard an audible voice. Okay. All right, one more question, and then we'll pray. Yes, G2. When John the Baptist was in a prison, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one... He will do, John, the, if I understand your question correctly, John the Baptist will do his best to tell his disciples, don't follow me, follow him. Most of his disciples will not do that. They will stick with, the, with John. But you will see as we go through, probably in the next few lessons, he will say to them, what are you guys following me for? He's the one. He must increase. I must decrease. Don't follow me. But they did anyway. So anyway, did I answer your question? Okay. All right, let me pray. Let's, uh, let's pause and then I'll turn you loose. Father, again, thank you for your word. And thank you for um, these disciples that came to follow Yeshua one by one. And Lord, help us to emulate them, to be disciples who will come to you and follow you and walk with you throughout our lives. But Lord, help us to be like Nathaniel, those without guile. Help us to be honest and transparent people, wisely honest and transparent, but still transparent before you especially, because we are already, but transparent before each other. So that we're not doing these devious little games we play with each other. Help us to, to just be honest and transparent and um, to be different in that way. Help our our, our character to grow so that we can be people who receive your praise. And thank you, Lord, that even though we fall short these days and we are people with deceit, de deceit and guile, still we have that promise that because we're born again, that in the Messiah, in Christ, that you view us free from sin, free from deceit, free from iniquity. And we look forward to the time when we will experience that, that freedom and that uh, truth uh, in our own souls. We look forward to your second coming and the kingdom when, all the, when the redemption will be accomplished. 
And we thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys next week.